Okay, let's shift gears just a little bit and go on to the next topic I had in mind today, the topic I, I originally wanted to uh, have for the second half hour of the program. While running across some different things this weekend, I ran into an interesting little piece from The Hill, thehill.com. There's a piece they put out there from uh, March 7th called An Obituary, the National Endowment for the Arts, 52 of Unnatural Causes. So basically The Hill is running an obituary for the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm going to read just a portion of this to you so you get kind of an idea where they're going. The National Endowment for the Arts, aged 52, has finally died. After brushes with extinction in the 1980s and 1990s, along with a three-decade wait to be launched after the McCarthy era's relentless attacks on artists, police are, describing the, police are describing the NEA's demise as totally preventable, but oddly, both a homicide and a suicide. The agency had been ill, although determined to make a difference for many years. The NEA expired under the care of President Donald Trump and the Tea Party Congress. It leaves as survivors its parent, the United States government. We are now the only country in the world without a federal arts presence. Other survivors include millions of artists and thousands of arts organizations. The NEA died because artists tried too hard to be the other, apart from society they, chron they chronicled. It failed to make the case that the arts should mean more to ordinary Americans than whatever they did as children. Overwhelmingly, Americans participate in the arts only when young. Late attempts at awkward medical procedures such as translating art into economic development did not improve the agency's health. The NEA will be remembered for its controversies such as supporting artists who performed in the nude or who explicitly sought to shock their audiences into facing hard truths of racism, sexism, the patriarchy, genocide, war, and homophobia. For being unable to simultaneously fund the best American art while reaching every state and for its political blunders, numerous and often naive. But the NEA will also be remembered as the agency that created arts councils in every state and most cities, that spread the professionalization of arts organizations throughout America, and that generated important new fields such as art therapy for war victims, creative placemaking and the rebirth of cities, research into economics, mental health, inequality and aging, among many, and whose leaders persuaded private funders of the value of artists and the arts. I, I'm going to stop right there. The, the article goes on. And as I'm sure you can tell by my reading of it, although if, if, just in case you're confused, I'll, I'll spell this out for you. That piece in the Hill was very much a tongue-in-cheek piece. Um, a mock obituary, if, if, if you will. Basically bemoaning the possibility that there will be cuts to the National Endowment for the Arts in the upcoming budget. And, of course, The Hill, in their own tongue-in-cheek way, was trying to illustrate for us all why this is a bad idea, why we need a National Endowment for the Arts, all the positives of it, blah, 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 blah. So it was a tongue-in-cheek piece. I'm not going to say it was satire, because it was kind of out there to make a very specific point. And, of course, the point they were making is one I disagree with. I, I don't agree that we need a National Endowment for the Arts. But when you see a story like this, when you see a piece like this, even in a mock obituary sort of way, I think it should raise the question. It certainly does raise the question to me anyway. What legitimate reason is there to fund the National Endowment for the Arts? In other words, what need is it fulfilling for America? If, if, if our nation, if our government, if most importantly our tax dollars are going to be used to fund this thing, okay, what need is that filling? Should we be funding the NEA? To put it most bluntly, is there a shortage of arts out there that our nation suffers from? Well, I would say the answer to that question is no. Now, granted, I could, I could sit here for a half hour and talk about all the god-awful stance, stances that NEA artists have taken over the years that performing in the nude, the Maplethorpe stuff and all that, but I'm not going to go there. Leaving aside the political disagreements with most of the NEA artists that I have, let's, let's not even go there. Let's instead look at this from the very strict question of 
is there a need for subsidized art in America? And my answer to that would be no, I don't think so. Art citizenry has art all around it. Nobody is being denied the opportunity to see or purchase art. Not only in terms of art galleries and different places you can see paintings and, and photographs and whatever, but the arts are all over the place, folks. I'm not saying that's a bad thing necessarily, but they're out there. You, even the poorest among us can engage in the arts through television or through magazines or through a simple radio stations hearing music. One could make the argument that the arts have kind of taken over society or at the very least pop culture. Now, I don't like what they do with that quite often, but again, we're setting that argument aside for right now. The bottom line is that even our most disadvantaged citizens have access to the arts, whether participating in them or consuming them. So in that sense, I don't see any reason for our tax dollars to go funding more art. The free market is already doing that. We don't need the government in there. And I take a question like that, and I also look at, at things like public broadcasting and national public radio. Again, acknowledging that PBS and NPR have a editorial bit that I find disgusting and anti-American, but I'm not even going to go there right now. Even if they did not have that bit, even if PBS and NPR were good little conservative pro-American stations, I still would not be in favor of our tax dollars funding them. Again, let's... Let's think about that in the most basic, basic of terms. If we're talking about PBS, publicly funded television broadcasting, is there a need for that in America? Is there a shortage of television broadcasting out there? Are the most disadvantaged people in America unable to have access to broadcast television? Well, the answer to that is no. Now, one could make the case, although I would disagree with them, but one could make the case that maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago, we were in a situation where access to broadcast television was not, was not universal. If you go back to the 1950s, even the 1960s, a lot of markets, a lot of towns only had one or two television stations. So the idea that, hey, people aren't having access to educational television programming, you could make that case. Again, I would disagree with you. I wouldn't have thought that it was the government's the government's job to, to fund it, but you could have at least made the case back then. But as we stand here in 2017, is that true? No. Now, most markets have multiple television stations, and on top of that, even our most impoverished people most often have cable television or satellite television or apps on their, their computers or their laptops or their phones that give them this programming. So if there was a time in American history that we could have said, hey, there's people out there that don't have access to quality broadcast television, however you define that term, we certainly cannot say it now. Now, some of you are jumping in and saying, well, what about, what about Sesame Street? You, you want to take Big Bird away from the kids? Well, no. First of all, Sesame Street's also on HBO now, too, so you don't need PBS to put it out there. But e even if we discount the HBO component of that, let me give you a great example of how the free market can do a, a very good job of acquiescing in these issues. I grew up in the Ozarks in southwest Missouri, in the Springfield, Missouri television market. And you may not be aware that the Springfield, Missouri television market was among one of the last to get a public television station of any sort. They did not get a PBS affiliate until the late, the, the mid-1970s. Well, of course, Sesame Street came out in 1969. It took the, the nation by storm. So you would think, hey, for a few years, Springfield, Missouri did not have Sesame Street. Oh, my God, what did those kids do? Except that Springfield, Missouri did have Sesame Street. You see what happened was that because of the demand for Sesame Street, Channel 3, the local NBC affiliate, a broadcast station, went ahead and got the Sesame Street program and broadcast it after the Today Show every morning until about 1975 or 76 or thereabouts when, when they got a PBS station there. So the point being, 
even without public television stations in that area, they were able to get the programming to the kids that they wanted or to the people that they wanted. No public television was necessary even back then for it. And that was an era before cable, before satellite. Just regular over-the-air broadcast television stations were able to accommodate it. To say nothing of today, when even, as I say, the most disadvantaged among us have 100, 200, 500 television stations to choose from. A whole worldwide web worth of programming to choose from. So why should we be, why should our tax dollars be funding any kind of programming? Regardless of what it is, regardless of what PBS puts out there, regardless of what NPR puts out there. Again, the same thing. We fund NPR, but is there a shortage of radio programming out there for people? Heck, the access to radio program, programming might even be more prevalent than the access to TV programming. Even the poorest person out there with a transistor radio can, can get radio programming in and different talk radio stations and music and whatever. There's no need for NPR. There's no need for PBS. So while I know that the Hill was trying to kind of use absurdity to make a point there, when we actually examine the point they made, I can't really see a legitimate reason for us to fund the National Endowment for the Arts, to fund PBS, to fund NPR, because the beauty of America, the beauty of the free market is that the arts, broadcast, television, radio, all of those things are being taken care of quite nicely by the free market.